All right. This week on the Roos White and Blue, the defending champion Montreal Alouettes go to 3-0. and The most dominant team of the 20s, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, go to 0-3. We'll talk about those other seven teams in the CFL as well. And what's up with all the scoring this season? Coming up on the Rouge White and Blue. Welcome to the Roos Right and Blue CFL podcast. As the bumper video says for this, it's Americans talking Canadian football. This American's name is Oz Davis. Joining me, as always, is my co-host Joe Pritchard, to whom I must ask, Joe, how are you doing? And is it better than Hamilton Tiger Cats fandom? Yes, it is. <laughs> okay. The Thai Cats uh, go to zero and three on the season after week three. Uh, we're going to be talking about their fate and the fates of the other nine teams, uh, eight teams in the league uh, right now. Uh, as is our usual want, I guess we'll begin with last week's game. Sound good to you, Joe? Well, I mean, we could skip one and one or one of them, and I wouldn't be <laughs> too upset. But yeah, if we're gonna, we might as well just do them all, right? Uh, it was only one play. It was only one play. I'm telling you, Joe. <laughs> one one bad defensive play and that ruined the whole game for the Bombers. But first, let's talk the mighty Matra Alouettes, specifically Alouettes 47, Ottawa Red Blacks 21 in week three of the 2024 CFL season. Well, I got to say, Joe, as an Alouettes fan, I love this game for obvious reasons. Uh, however, uh, I do always in sports tend to see the dark cloud rather than the silver lining. And I got to say, after this game, I was worrying a bit if this is the peak for these Alouettes. Uh, peak performance? Oh, sure. you'd fit right in with Winnipeg sports fans. <laughs> Well, I mean, this is 11 in a row, okay? Couldn't have asked for more in this game. Uh, some great Canadian scores in this game as well. It was 17 to 1 after the first quarter, 30 to 1 at half, uh, making basically the entire second half of the game garbage time. Pretty much uh, no lead is safe, notwithstanding. Uh, Tyrese Beverett was Probably, I don't. In my estimation, Beverett was the player of the week. Uh, oh, yeah. The Edmonton fans might have a call to question that, but as far as I'm concerned, Tyrese Beverett was player of the week, offense or defense. Uh, I mean, he had the force fumble, he had the fumble recovery, he had the interception on the Red Blacks' first offensive play from scrimmage. He had the quarterback sack and. Like the play I just mentioned, that was the dominance of this Alouettes team, beginning with that interception on the first Ottawa play from scrimmage. I mean, this chased uh, the opening drive from the Alouettes, which resulted in a touchdown with little resistance. Um, just wanted to say really quickly, Cody Fajardo 
career game for the man. Uh, 28 of 35 for 393 yards, three touchdowns against zero picks, one rushing touchdown as well. My question for you, Joe, is how did you know to play Fajardo last week in fantasy? I didn't. <laughs> you, I thought for sure you had him starting at quarterback. How did you know? No, I did not. Oh, you did not? Oh, okay. No. Who did you start last week? I think I started Bo on the cheap, or was that week two? No, I started Trevor Harris. Oh, okay. Right. Pick. I'm confusing this with last week because you had Bo Levy Mitchell last week, and I forgot to ask you how you knew to start him last week. So <laughs> clearly the same thing. I'm thinking maybe that uh, I, I have this question in my notes because my opponent in fantasy football this week must have started him and thus cost me the game. Uh, quite a great pick for those who had Fajardo in fantasy. Who would have known? that he had the best week of basically anybody, I think, in the league. Maybe Beth L. Thompson was comparable in fantasy points. But, wow. Um, I don't know. Do you have any takeaways from this game vis-a-vis -vis either the Owls or the Red Blacks, Joe? Well, I mean, Tyson Pelpot still ridiculously cheap in fantasy, so that was fun. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I at least I got, got some of those points, but my opponent also had Fajardo, so I lost. So, oh, okay, there you I go. mean, yeah. I put up 135 points and still lost. So you know, one of those weeks. Wow, gee, you did better than me. I mean, I lost as well, but <laughs> not by much. No, um, uh, that this one isn't too much of a surprise. Montreal's really, really good, and Ottawa isn't quite there yet. I mean, yeah, I mean, I we'll mean, see. We've seen Ottawa against a. Winnipeg team that just hasn't gotten it going yet, and or at least I hope that's what's happening here. And a Montreal team that is the hottest team that we've seen since maybe the 2015 Hamilton Tiger Cats. Yeah, yeah, or uh, the BC Lions in the first half of the season a couple of years ago. They were. Yeah, uh, it's possible too. Yeah, that's just, that's just the one that sticks with me. Is like they were just oh, unbeatable yeah. until Kolaris yeah. went down. Yeah, that was a machine. Uh, the BC Lions were a machine uh, with their former quarterback now in the NFL. And uh, the Argos last year, in fact, were quite the machine. But this was your classic CFL mismatch. I mean, I mean, not only you know did the Alouettes score on that first drive, and not only did Beverett get that interception on the first Red Blacks play, but Bob Dice challenged that interception and 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 quite honestly a rather hopeless gesture uh and thus threw away that advantage as well so it's just you know right from the go nothing worked for the red blacks in this game i i should say that the uh the bright spot here was justin hardy who had a monster game uh as a uh, and, and the only thing is second monster game of the year, I should say, actually. And this guy is not cheap in fantasy anymore because of it. Um, I mean, I, I'm not sure what to attribute this to, although I will say that defenses have been doing a nice job shutting down uh, Dominic Rimes in the first couple of games, the Winnipeg defense, and now Montreal this week. Other than that, wow. Um about the only nice thing I can say about Hamilton, uh, about Ottawa, is they, they get Hamilton this week. Yeah, and we'll get to see. Okay, they played a team that's not playing well. They played a team that's playing really well. Okay, we've got another team that's not playing very well. Let's see who Ottawa is. Yeah, right, right. I think it'll be a fair game at least next week. Okay, then the game that Joe doesn't really want to discuss, but I don't know. I don't. I don't think it was as bad as as he thinks. Uh, BC Lions twenty six, Winnipeg Blue Bombers twenty four. Uh, Lions went into this game a two point underdog, came out a two point winner. Um, this game was quite the nail biter. I mean, I mean, how would you how would you put this on a scale of one to uh, heart attack in terms of tenseness, Joe? I mean, it's June, so you're not going to yeah. get anything above a seven. But, you know, okay, six seemed to be there. You know, 
Okay. Definitely some jittery <laughs> moments, especially late in the game. But really, I thought the score flattered the Bombers. I was surprised they were even in it late because they really? started off really slow again. BC yep. was up 10 nothing, And yep. Winnipeg was getting no pass rush on Vernon Adams whatsoever. He had time to sit back there, make a hot dog, make a tweet, eat the hot dog, and then find a guy 40 yards downfield because the second year he can only cover for, what, eight, nine seconds before somebody's going to get open, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The lack of pass rush and the injuries on the defensive line hurt really, really bad. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You could really feel the injuries uh, in this game. And now we have another one, Dalton Schoen. Uh, Mm -hmm. injured in this game he'll be out for the medium term future apparently they haven't been specific about it but we know he's missing the next game he's on the sixth game so oh he is on the sixth game okay Mm -hmm. Uh, okay so i don't know for me joe i i thought that this game illustrated more than anything just the explosiveness of the lions i mean this is a team where you know, they can have successful plays in a row and then just torch you. I mean, I mean, look, um, Vernon Adams had two passes to Hollins alone that accounted for 134 yards. Yeah, including lots of, lots of explosion the, plays because that's what happens when right. the quarterback gets more than three or four seconds to throw the ball. Oh, yeah, but there are other times, too, when Vernon's getting three, four seconds leading the pass, you know, forcing it. I mean, like, like, okay, so, so, again, here's the Bombers again. They have the late lead, okay? They're up 24-23, 150 left in the game, and um, really could have put it away. Uh, or, no, I'm sorry, it was still, it was 26-24 at that point. So the Bombers do not have the lead. However, all they need is the stop, and it's over. Okay? First play. Adams has a decent amount of time, throws it away. It's second and 10. Bam. You got the 62, 63-yarder, 62, 63-yarder, whatever it was. And the game was over. I mean, that's all it took. It didn't matter how well the, the Bombers might have shut down at that the offense at that point. They didn't. But... It doesn't really matter. That was game. No, and they also didn't go for it on third and six right before that. Yes. Yes. Where? Yeah, because you give up a first down regardless of where you're on the field. The game's probably over. Yeah. So are you going to trust your defense that hasn't been, you know, and they didn't play terribly considering the injuries. I'm not going to sit here and slam them. No. They did what they could do but it wasn't enough uh, to handle a high flying passing attack because you have to get pressure on the quarterback to stop that from happening. But especially considering that I was surprised that they made the call to punt it and trust the defense at that point, because the offense finally started to resemble a Winnipeg blue bombers offense, probably about the start of the second quarter. They started going East West a little bit with the run game. They got the run game involved. Brady Oliveira came off the bench. He's been dealing with some injuries, which is also uh, a plot point here too, because he's what the team usually leans on to say, Hey, let's take control of this game. Yeah. And when he's hurt, it's hard to do that. Uh, but a lot more East West, a lot more short passes, uh, uh, they are actually injured in. They actually had so many injuries. Chris Serveler, Str- Chris Serveler went from um, a Swiss Army knife, where you can put him in anywhere and uh, you know see what would happen, and try to get the defense off of their game. To he literally had to be a receiver because <laughs> there were there weren't in enough left. That's how yeah, deep was, this team is in injuries right now. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Ten, he had ten uh, touches, let's say, mm-hmm. in this game. Uh, yeah, so yeah, Sean was in there for quite a, quite a while too. There was one uh, series where he was behind center uh, for most of the most of the drive. Uh, mm-hmm. So 
So yeah, I thought it was an interesting maneuver there, but it's you know it's, right. But the creativity it's was back in the, the creativity was back in the play calling. You couldn't yeah. just yeah. go look at them, see what they were how they were lined up, and go okay, they're going to do this like it was in week two. Okay. All right. I'm going to jump into this. I was going to wait a little bit longer on this, but okay. So yes, the defense for the Bombers has been wounded, has been shorthanded, whatever, all season. But there has been a lot of scoring in this league this season. Okay. Look this up. Uh, okay. So last year, in the first three weeks of the seasons, five times a team scored. 29 or more points in a game okay this year it's happened nine times already but it hasn't happened to the bombers yet okay so there's a lot of defenses giving up a lot of points here but the bombers are not one of them so you know it's almost as though the well okay i'm sure that on one end every you know the bar the bombers have the target on their back, right? Everybody wants to beat Winnipeg this year. Okay, fair enough. But on the other hand, the defense has not been brutal at all. No, it's it just, hasn't been bad, but it's also no. a defense that they've been relying on to win games for them for the right. last three or four years, and they're not right. in that position right now. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, this – this, things might work out by the end of the season. The fact is that, the, I mean, the fact that the defense is competent enough, you know, being this shorthanded, um, really should give some confidence. And plus, the other thing, too, is that the Bombers are hitting this, this you know, the injury bug. They're getting tormented by the injury bug right now. Um, so this might be the time of year to, to go through that sort of trauma. As so, opposed to November, but... Right, let's, right, right. Let's let's not count our chickens at this point either, right? No, but <laughs> but every team is going to face the injury bug at one point or another, unless you're Toronto last season. And, uh, you know, it's just better that it's happening to them now. Perhaps we might look back at this and say, well, they got it together by the end of the season. So it's just bad luck right now, maybe for Winnipeg. And it just uh, also like goes, and the one thing I pulled away from all of this too, for the past few weeks, it's been panic time in Bowerville. But yep. you just think about how fragile teams are when they lose this many um, oh, yeah. consistent contributors over the past yep. five years are just all of a sudden gone. And then you just kind of go, it's amazing they, the run lasted as long as they did before we hit any sort of turbulence like this mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yep yep the bombers have been for a cfl team that's dynastic uh the bombers have been remarkable in roster consistency mm -hmm. until perhaps this season but even then it's not too too bad uh yeah i can't even, i can't i can't remember the last time they lost three in a row yep. maybe 19 before uh, between yeah. nickels and Nichols and Claris, maybe. I'm thinking so. maybe 2016 at the beginning of the season before they switched to Nichols off of Drew Willie. That's probably about where we're at for a three-game losing streak like that. Right. Yeah, it's been a while. It's been a while. Um, okay. Uh, game three, which is what prompted me to to go on the search of uh, numbers for this high scores yeah i mean this is like the 90s <laughs> this this season uh any game not involving the the alouettes i feel it's going to turn into a pinball machine here toronto argonauts 39 edmonton elks 36. classic barn burner but what's really interesting here was that this was really a case of two different styles of offense i mean not much defense to speak of here but on the offense, really interesting stuff happening. Of course, on Edmonton, you had McLeod Bethel Thompson, who had the fantasy fantasy week, basically. Uh, Bethel Thompson has been one of two, I would say, really consistent fantasy quarterbacks this season so far. Uh, just a monster stat line. 28 of 38, 342 yards, and four passing touchdowns. But here on the other side, 
you know, staying even the whole game with these guys was the Argos with Cameron Dukes at quarterback. And the TSN guys made a lot out of the fact that in the first half, he had 90 yards passing on nine of 10, ended up 18 of 21 passing for 214 yards, two touchdowns. Uh, and he ran in a touchdown as well for the, the game's first touchdown, I believe and zero picks i mean plus they have a running game here where uh the running backs combined for 25 carries for 169 yards that's 6.8 almost 6.8 yards per carry wow scintillating uh matchup here huh joe yeah it was Back, it was back and forth. It was a game you didn't expect Edmonton to be able to pull off against a Toronto team like that. But and you also didn't expect Toronto to be able to hit back as well as they would, as well as they did, given that their defense was giving up points all over the board. Yep, 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 yep. Uh, again, not too much defense in this game. Uh, I wanted to touch on this, and and you know here on the Roost White and Blue, we are typically not so gauche as to you know blame one person for these losses, but predictably enough there in Edmonton and and really elsewhere in the CFL, even on TSN, there has been some questioning of Chris Jones's play calling this season. Uh, here again, here it is. Fourth quarter, 120 remaining in the game. Elks have the lead. They're on their own five yard line. And the call is for two passes? Uh, not sure that was the best call there. Um, even if, okay, even if you are successful and you get the first down on a short passing play. The clock stops, right? So, so I just don't understand why they're not running off some time. You either force the timeouts, or you you kill some clock. I mean, the, they ended up, you know, punting it from the five yard line, and and all they needed, all the Argos needed to win the game was the thirty seven yard return. And the Kadeem Carey, who was unstoppable, 15-yard run. That was it. Toronto wins. They get to run out the clock. Toronto wins. And, I mean, I just feel like if they had run the ball once, you know, for one yard, the Elks might have won this game. I don't know. Is that fair? It's possible. Um, you'd have to – yeah, because you get just – cycling through the rules in my head yeah you, the clock does stop after a running play but on then it starts down. again yeah you stop get well it reset. starts on a first down it starts on a first down it stops on a first down right. well it stops after every play it's just they reset and then they start the clock again right right, right. incomplete right. pass they don't start the clock again right 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 but again that we could we could burn some clock here we could burn some clock here and uh Again, Argo's defense isn't awesome, but when you're on your own five, I mean, that's, you know, uh, go, go passing feels like desperation. You know, I was just really surprised. I mean, again, like, like, okay, so now this is the second game or is this the actual third loss in the fourth quarter? Can we actually say that they've blown all three of these games so far? And, you know, this one, for me, it just came down to a coaching decision. Um, unfortunate, unfortunate. So now here is the point where I ask you, Joe, why is there so much scoring? What, why, why has this season been so high scoring? Usually the offenses start slower than the defenses do. Right. This year, right. not so much. Yeah, not at all. Not at all. Um, is there, I mean, do we have a, a unifying theory here? I mean, I don't. Okay. I think it. We might be. It may be matchup based. It may be. It may be that the teams that are scoring a lot have something that 
works really well against defenses that aren't prepared for them. I mean, you look at Montreal, Ottawa, Montreal's rolling right now. You look at, I, I don't have an explanation for Edmonton except for McLeod Bethel Thompson's making people stop yeah, talking about Trey Ford for this week. Yeah. Oh, yeah. give it another week and we'll be back to that. <laughs> and I don't blame people for wanting to see Trey Ford in there. He's an exciting player. I'm just thinking about the future as opposed to the right now. And the right now is that Edmonton's not ready to compete for a great cup this year. So why not let him develop some more on the bench? But that's just me. Uh, I also haven't had to sit in the stands for the last five years and see the team fall off a cliff. So they, I've got that going for me as well. <laughs> well, Bethel Thompson has just been a beast. And, you know, they do have a nice receiving core out there in Edmonton as well. They do. You know, there's, so there's pieces in play here. Yeah, and I think zero and three might be might not be entirely fair, but it's what they've got so far. So I don't think no, they, they start. Oh, they don't start zero and nine this year. I don't think they finish no. four and fourteen this year. I think they do better than that. But it'd be nice if they could finish one of these things and make a stop talk. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they've demonstrably thrown away two of these games. Yeah, I Probably. mean, if they can they can wait until after the they can wait for games that they're not playing Winnipeg to like finish games. That'd be great. But <laughs> especially against the Saskatchewan. Oh yeah, that'd, they be, had... that'd be nice. But they've been doing yeah. they've been blowing games in Saskatchewan for the last couple of years now. I yeah, think. yeah, yeah. They really, really have. They really have. Um, okay, and then finally, speaking of scoring a lot of points. Uh, the week ended with Saskatchewan Rough Riders 36, Hamilton Tiger Cats 20. Now, here are the Riders. The Riders have put up 98 points already this season in the three games. Now, this was the one game that I did not see. Unfortunately, traveling got in the way of me even catching the replay within the 48-hour window. Yes, did because make... you are actually in the Western Hemisphere for once. Yeah, yeah, back on this side of the planet. I did wake up super early on Monday morning to catch a super early flight, and I flipped on this game, which was still live in the third quarter, saw the score, and said, nope, I guess I better pack instead. Uh, so uh, didn't really see the game, only uh, read about it, watched the highlights. Um, and, uh, yeah, well, as far as I could see, Okay, my impression was based on, you know, sec one degree of separation is that this was really the first time this season that the Riders actually won a game outright, you know, rather than depending on, you know, somebody else screwing up. Yeah, be getting it handed to them, basically. Uh, they actually generated five turnovers versus one giveaway. Uh, they won the time of possession, 34 minutes to 26, basically, and uh, actually were out penalized by the Tiger Cats. Only eight penalties for the Riders in this game. So, I mean, sounds strange for a team that's three and zero, but uh, this is clearly their best game of the year so far. Uh, like I say, it's the first time they didn't get it handed to them. Um, I don't know. Uh, what what is your feeling on the riders going forward they're still the horseshoe team i mean so far they have been yeah. that seems to be a pretty consistent thing when they start out june july okay. win a couple of games that they probably shouldn't have and then by september october they're losing games they shouldn't have lost so yeah it all balances out in the end usually um Seems like Trevor Harris is going to be okay from the knee injury he had that took him out of the game in the third quarter. Yep. They had no need to rush him back. He would look like he was ready to go if he was needed. Uh, Shea Patterson got some reps. Uh, they yep. were in control of this. Their defense was making Bob's life miserable. It's just, yeah, they took control of this one and said, no, we're, we're, we're not going to wait until the end. We're going to take this one ourselves. Uh, on the other side, you have sadness. <laughs> Bo, Bo Levy Mitchell, 45 passing attempts, okay, now due in no small part to 
a lack of a respectable running game here. 29 completions on 45 for 295 yards. Now that's six and a half yards per attempt. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that includes the 141 yarder to uh, Shamar Bridges, who was excellent in this game. It was just indefensible in this game. Um, the defense had produced just one turnover. Uh, there was the interception on the first drive of the first quarter, right? And the interception was on the 10, and they ended up getting minus five yards of offense uh, and punting it after a two and out. So, you know, about the only thing that one turnover by the Hamilton defense achieved was that it prevented the 73 to nothing game, basically. Uh, there were a couple of sacks by the Tie Cats, but, you know, too little, too late. But really, the worst thing for me is that I'm wondering where you would put this on a panic scale, Joe, is poor Tim White. Six targets, no catches. And in fact, the last two of the three interceptions that Bo threw were targeted for White. Okay. So, I mean, what do we make of Mr. Mitchell? What do we make of Mr. White? What, I mean, what can Hamilton look forward to going forward here? Oh, they can look forward to not sitting outside in November at Tim Hortons Field. <laughs> oh! Harsh, harsh, but perhaps true. I mean, oh, with Toronto, Toronto and Montreal already have the jump on you, and it's yeah. not even July yet. And you did, weren't expected to do all that much this year anyway. I think it's pretty safe to say it's going to be a long season in Hamilton. It's they should to be better like than this. Yes. And I expect them to bounce back. I expect them to have better games. I expect them to have better days. I mean, they almost beat Saskatchewan in week two, but they got – I. I'm trying to find hope for them, and I don't see it. I mean, when Tim White can't produce for you, when, when, you, when you have few enough weapons that, you know, you can take Tim White out of the game, I mean, like, what are you going to do at that point? I mean, it feels to me like it didn't really happen last season, but it feels to me like the Ticats are that CFL team that's going to wait too long to switch quarterbacks. No, wait, I take that back because actually it did happen last season. It happened with Edmonton. All right. There's always that one team that waits just a bit too long to switch out their starting quarterback. And, you know, by the time there's some optimism being generated, the season's over. Yeah, you know, like, I feel like they, they could be this year's Edmonton, yeah. where they start off 0 and 9. Like, yeah, that's how little I see out of this team right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It feels like that, however, they do have a shot at redemption next week. <laughs> uh, I like to talk next week's games, but let me do the plug for our sponsor, Royal Retros at royalretros.com. By retros, we're talking about retro memorabilia. Uh, there at royalretros.com, you can get ball caps, jerseys, t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, hoodies, jackets, and the proverbial more. Royal Retro has the gear and the paraphernalia representing dozens of teams from dozens, I would say, defunct sports leagues, including the USFL, the old USFL, the Arena Football League, the World Football League, the XFL, Football Canada, various pro hockey leagues, including the WHA, ABA Basketball, and, for me, the real selling point, a category, a category for baseball called the Majors. By the Majors Royal Retro royal retros means teams like the st louis browns and seattle pilots but also the negro league teams and the pacific coast league teams uh, best of all you can get 10 percent off still anything in the store when you use promo code rwbcfl at checkout royalretros.com promo code rwbcfl for 10 percent off i have some royal retros gear coming to me that Probably next week's show 
you can see for yourselves. Ooh. RoyalRetros.com, RWB, CFL, at checkout for 10% off. Yeah, right. You're gonna leave me in suspense because I want to be surprised. <laughs> oh, I was yeah. actually oh. contemplating my own purchase the other day, but oh, I'm not gonna say I'm not gonna trigger say yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's 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 well worth it. I mean, I'm gonna try and load up here a little bit before I go back uh, out uh, to Europe because at least that way I can be assured that I would get it before the end of the season. So I <laughs> uh, would like to load up on that. So uh, let's talk next week's games. Now, last week, Joe, much to his own chagrin, went 4-0 in CFL Pick'em. So in one respect, the Rouge, White, and Blue is 11-1 and in Pick'em so far this season if you choose the correct one of us to, to side with each week. So we've each had a couple of good weeks. Uh, I wonder which of us will have a good week this week. Uh, I'm predicting it's going to be Joe because I'm sure I've got some picks here that Joe will not agree with. So we're going to have some conflict this week, I'm sure. Oh, and I would like to say this at this point, too. Over there, the official website, cfl.ca, when you can play CFL Pick'em, okay? I have one minor quibble in case anybody there is listening to this. Uh, Joe, and I'm sure you will agree with, with this minor issue that I have. When you fill out the Pick'em card for the week, let's say, uh, as a little bonus uh, sort of gimmick that the league has is they, they ask you to choose which play of the week was the better play. You know, it's just kind of a kind of a popularity contest, kind of just seeing how the fans felt. Okay, I beg the league, stop putting riders' highlights as one of the two choices. It's always going to win. Well, There's I mean, no this week they had a Riders highlight against a game-winning field goal. I mean, right. which one's going to win in general, <laughs> and which one's going to win because it's a uh, a spectacular play versus hey, look, a garden variety field goal that only really matters because it happened with zeros on the clock. Yeah, but the <laughs> yeah, yeah, but Joe, the truth is, you could run a Riders. You know, you could run a rider's off-tackle run for three yards versus, you know, Vernon Adams connecting for 90 yards, you know, for the touchdown, and the rider's play would still win. Oh, probably. Come on now. The, <laughs> the fans are biased here. <laughs> you know, the riders are not going to lose this contest. It doesn't matter. <laughs> so, I don't know. I've just been... I don't even look at the numbers anymore. Whenever there's a Riders uh, play up there, I just bet against the Riders play because I know it's going to be 77 to 23 uh, percent to their favor. So I don't know. I just want to go up there one week and see see a competition, and neither play is from Saskatchewan. So we're starting off the week, and we're going to start off the conflict this week between Joe and I. I'm sure. Edmonton Eskimos are seven and a half point underdogs at BC. Okay. Um, now, the big news about this story before the game starts is that Vernon Adams was listed as questionable for this game. However, uh, we're recording this on Wednesday, the 26th in the afternoon. The team has already come out and said that Adams will be starting despite that report. So we probably won't be seeing Jake Dalagawa starting. Uh, Jake Dalagawa and his two and eight record as a CFL starter probably won't see that this week. But I would be surprised if Adams goes the whole game, and I would be surprised too if Adams is at a hundred percent. Kind of surprised that they're even gonna uh, play him in this game, being a home game being Edmonton. Uh, Edmonton will be without Hergie Mayala, but, you know, McLeod Bethel Thompson, I don't think this year he cares who he's throwing to. He still has a lot of targets there in Edmonton anyway. Um, now, I don't know, against all rationality, 
And there again, I'm I'm just banking on the fact that uh, Vernon Adams is probably not a hundred percent. I am banking on the fact that I don't think uh, there'll be a monster game from any BC receiver this week. Maybe, maybe. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna take the shocker here. I'm gonna I'm gonna take Edmonton, I, and I definitely have money on them plus the seven and a half. Okay, I, well, I could close. I could follow the logic, but I, Vernon's my fantasy quarterback, and <laughs> Alexander Hollins is there. I think, yeah, if he sits down, it'll be because they're up by like thirty. So, okay, I want to see from Edmonton a finish, but B, okay, that Toronto game was good. What uh, what else you got? Right, right, right. Because they don't seem I, to go into BC very well lately. Yeah, no, no. That was one thing I was looking at. Um, you know, Bethel Thompson hasn't been particularly awesome against BC either in his CFL career. But I don't know. You have to pick these upsets somewhere, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know. And uh, I think that yeah, I think. Oh, and three is a bit surprising for Edmonton. I think they could have won one of these games of the of the three losses. So I don't. I'm just. I'm kind of looking for the numbers to balance out here. Again, I think that the Lions might regret not, you know, sitting Adams for this game. I think this might be a wasted loss for. BC. I don't know. I just get the feeling. I just get the feeling the stars are aligning this week for Edmonton. Finally. Finally. And again, if they're not going to go 9-0, and if they're not going to go 0-9 to start the season, no time like the present is my feeling. So, I don't have much scientific yeah. to back I just think up. BC knows that they've got Winnipeg over a barrel right now and want to put on step on the gas. Because they'd love to yes. host the West Final, right? Yes. Oh, yes. In BC? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Nice dome situation. Yeah, I'm sure they would prefer that. Um, Okay, okay. I've gone back and forth on this one about a million times since looking at it. So so I'm going to have you go first, Joe, and I I would probably take the opposite of what you take. Montreal is a three-point favorite at Toronto. And wow, if you had given us this line a month ago, it might not have been as believable uh, as it is now. So what are, what are you thinking in this game, Joe? I'm thinking that I have more confidence in Montreal than you do, which is uh, when you go over the course of the show, which has been since 2015, seems to be how we always do things, right? <laughs> I just think they're playing too well right now, and Toronto is – slightly undermanned based off of what they were last year. They obviously didn't have their best game last week against Edmonton, so they may be struggling to put it together with all the losses they've dealt with over the past few months here with different players leaving for different reasons. I think Montreal, if they play the way they've been playing, I don't think anybody beats them. They're going to have to play a B or C game for anybody to catch them because if they're on their A game, they're going to win. But with all the with all the missing pieces for Toronto, there's one thing to say about them is that this team just doesn't make mistakes on offense. You know? No, this, but Montreal's very, very good at forcing teams to make mistakes on offense. Yes. Yes. That's that's the that's the minus here for Toronto is that the only the only outstanding defense this early in the season has been Montreal. Right. And, and if they Toronto are gets into day. if Toronto gets into a situation where they have to play Chase, it's over. If Toronto yes. gets up on top, they have a chance to grind it out. I don't see Toronto having another shootout like they did last week. Yeah, I do not believe that Montreal will have a shootout this season until I see it. Okay. Uh, again, for me, if I'm taking Toronto in this game, I might. Um for me, this is just a numbers thing. Uh, really, the only 
the only facet that really terrifies me is Kadeem Carey and the other runners for Toronto. And they've been well above average uh, in this area this season. However, Kadeem Hardy is dinged up. I mean, he's been limited in practice this week. So he'll play, but I don't know if he'll have anything like the first few games he's had, first couple of games he's had for Toronto this season. Uh, but for me, it's just a numbers game. Um, I mean, okay, look, the Alouettes have won 11 in a row. They've won 11 in a row. And I don't really see the only, the only non freakish losses that I can see for them upcoming are this game, uh, in a couple of weeks when the Alouettes get Toronto in Montreal. And then possibly week 11, which is still August, at Regina. So, you know, I could they, I mean, could the Alouettes really whip off another seven wins in a row? They're going to lose one of these games to Toronto, I think. So Entirely possible. But really, if you're going to blow a tire, you might blow it against like an Ottawa or something where you just don't, don't have – you're not coming yeah. into the game fully, like, fully prepared like you normally would be. I don't think – Yeah, upsets will and, happen. And, again, it would be playing their C game, and I would have to play their A game. But that's where the Bombers would lose those couple of times when they were in 20, 2021 or 22 where they were just dominant would be – Oh, we just we had we had a game that we were expected to win by fifteen, and well, that's what happens when we expect that all the time. Right, right. That's the thing. You can't plan for the upset, right? That was that's what makes it an upset. Um, and yeah, like at the beginning of the season, I feared getting Ottawa in week three because just. You know, for the sake of, you know, division rivals, you know, upsets do happen or whatever. But, you know, you can't really plan for the upsets. So, again, like, I'm just looking at the numbers. I'll probably take Toronto in the pick em game, but I won't be happy about it. I certainly won't play this for money in the sports book. That's for sure. Okay, now, Winnipeg. Three-point favorites <laughs> at Calgary. Calgary is coming off the bye week. And the Stamps under Dave Dickinson have had this reputation as being you know, pretty great coming off the bye. Now, the truth is, is that Dickinson, as the Stamps head coach, is 14-6 and six off the bye. But Went back and looked at the history. Okay, here's the thing. <laughs> yes, 14 and 6. But the Stamps, prior to 2020, okay, with Dickinson as coach, were 10 and 2 off the bye, plus 103 point differential. Okay, so your average game, they're winning by about nine points off the bye. Since then, four and four, right? They are plus 26, but that's mostly due to a, like, uh, they beat Edmonton a couple of years ago by, like, 43 points. You take away that game, and they're three and four, and they're minus 17 since 2020, okay? This is not the stamps of old, right, coming out of this bye week. Now, Winnipeg, like we said, they're down a lot of injuries. They're down a lot of men due to injuries. They're down Dalton Shen this week. Okay. Uh, but, hey, I don't care. I'm looking for a big game from, from Brady Oliveira. I think that this time out, the defense will do enough in the fourth quarter to shut down these stamps, who are just not a high-scoring team this year. And so I'm going to take Winnipeg. I'm going to take Winnipeg. Again, okay. the thing that worries me in this one is Jake Mayer's completing deep passes this year, which yep. wasn't happening oh, last yeah. year at all. Yep. You couple that with going on the road to Calgary, which I mean, they 
they haven't been Calgary hasn't been great the past few years, but they're better at home on the, than on the road. Mm-hmm. You couple that with you couple Mayer completing the deep balls that he wasn't last year with a lot of time to do it with Reg, Reggie Bagleton, with the receiving core they have, and the fact that Winnipeg's struggling to get their offense together right now, and I could easily see this one going Calgary's way. Wow. Are, are you going to take Calgary? In the- I am taking Calgary on this. I'm hoping wow. I'm, I'm hoping the, for the reverse jinx by doing okay. it. But okay. No, I can I can see I can see a scenario where Calgary wins by you know 7 to 10 a lot easier than I could see a scenario where, where Winnipeg just runs away with it. Oh yeah, no, no 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 no, I don't think they'll run away with it. I don't think they'll run away with it. Calgary is playing smart ball. You know, they're right. they're and, and here's the and here's the thing that tipped me over the edge. Even the past 3 4 years where Winnipeg's been where Winnipeg's taken over in the in the rivalry because yeah. it was because calgary was dominating winnipeg in the 2010s that's just calgary dominated everybody but especially winnipeg um i think the one win winnipeg had in calgary for like 15 years was a was a completely useless like week 21 game in 2014 in a snowstorm like it was <laughs> that kind of thing where you went winnipeg goes into calgary and it was like hamilton going into calgary it just wasn't happening right <laughs> Yeah. Even the last couple of years where things have gotten gone Winnipeg's way, they're winning the game on the last play of the game. Yeah. They're giving, you know, Rene Paradis was short by a yard on a 53 yarder to win to that would have won it yeah. a couple of years ago. Yeah. Like they're in situations where every game is a nail biter with Calgary for the most part. If they get into that situation, maybe they pull it off again, but there's less to be confident about this year than there was last year. In that front. Wow. Okay. Wow. There is pessimism in Winnipeg. Okay. Um, I'd love wow. to be wrong. I'd love to see them go put out forty and like. Okay, they're back. They figured it out now. <laughs> I just don't like. Like last week, I didn't like how they matched up. Wow. Okay. Well. I've got Oliveira on my fantasy team, so I'm hoping he has a big game and the Winnipeg, the Peggers. Uh, Great to establish that identity again as a power football team. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. There was so many missing pieces. It's hard to, hard to establish, hard to establish. Wow. We might have a first on the Rouge, White, and Blue here though, because I think we're going to have four disagreements here. The final game of the week is, is uh, the tie cats. One and a half, just one and a half point underdogs at Ottawa. And I am pretty sure, based on the review of last week's games, that, Joe, you have the Red Blacks here. Yes, do. Okay. All right. And what's your thinking here in this game of low-watt offenses and low-pressure defenses? Ottawa is more likely to be able to put together sustainable drives okay. not turn and not turn the ball over. Drew Brown isn't like isn't lighting up the league yet. He's no. young. He's had only had a handful of starts between the two places he's been. But he also hasn't been like he hasn't had just an awful game either anywhere. Like when he come when he came into Winnipeg off the bench, he won two games off the bench in Winnipeg. He did well in his starts. But he's not going to put up a clunker, and Hamilton's not going to take the ball from him five times. No. You can see a scenario where Hamilton turns it over five times. I can't see a scenario where Ottawa turns it over five times. And I think that's kind of where I'm at is if we're going to, if this is a game of mistakes, if it's going to be one big play changes the game, Ottawa's making that big play in Hamilton eight. Wow. Really? Okay. 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 Cause I'm, I'm, I mean, the way I figured that is this, um, I, don't know if Ottawa is going to be able to shut down White like he was last week. I don't know if they're going to be able to put pressure on to Mitchell. Okay, and I'm not worried about that because they kept. You're not worried about that. They they made Zach Kolaros run for his life in week two. Okay, 
Okay. I mean, all right. maybe, so maybe. maybe that's the way it's going to be all season in Winnipeg. Who knows? It wasn't last week, to be fair. So mm-hmm. maybe Ottawa has a better pass rush than we're giving him credit for. And I'm giving them those points of they can probably make Bo's life more miserable than Hamilton can make Drew Brown's life miserable. Mm-hmm. It's kind of all in that same bucket for me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um. Okay. All right. All right, I can see that. I can see that. Um, and Ottawa's at home, so yeah. Even Ottawa though they're at, even though they're at home, then they don't win at home. Well, Hamilton's <laughs> on the road, so there's right that kind of balances each other out too. Wow. Yeah. So you're making me doubt myself here. Uh, this to me, this is a bit of a coin flip. I mean, again, it's like you know, one and a half. Uh, point. I mean, take so Hamilton. So we're on the opposite side of everything, but yeah, I'm gonna. I have Hamilton in my notes. I already filed my Pickham uh, card for the week, so and I have Hamilton. So I think I'm gonna go with Hamilton here. Um, really, it's, it's hard to say it about a week four game, but this might not be a very meaningful game, especially if Hamilton wins. Uh, and again, too, I think it would be. Quite the odd scenario if we have Toronto at two and one and Ottawa at two and one. <laughs> those are both, those are very different two and ones there, I think, in that situation. So I don't know. Again, I'm just going by the numbers here and I'm going to take Hamilton to uh, pull this off, um, off this win. And if my scenario happens, this would mean that the only undefeated or winless team in the league would be the Riders. So I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong on a couple of these um, in any case. Okay, so wow. Scintillating pick up, pick a matchup between us this week. Uh, Joe, uh, do you have any fantasy tips? Yeah, I think the running backs can be had for cheap. It really feels like the numbers, the salary numbers, are way down this year compared to last year. Last yeah. year, you had to basically burn a position to right. have any hope of fielding a reasonable lineup. This year, you can get away with filling your team with starters and feeling pretty good about it. Yeah. And spending at quarterback and spending at receiver. and Because last year, I, I would cheap on receiver all season long this year i'm like i still have money which receivers do i upgrade to right right even got to the point because i took like hamilton's defense is less than 5k right now Mm -hmm. i took them just off of the just based off of the fact that that's the position to burn as opposed to hey let's hope for some one of these defenses to pitch a shutout and have five picks Mm. (laughs) Uh, I, that's a risk, and which one? That's a that's a gamble. I'll take the offensive players I know better. Yeah, something's got to be done about defense. I'm 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 paying for these defenses as much as for a receiver. Okay? Yeah, or and, or your second running back, or your right. Coach. And 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 last week, for example, I mean, the Alouettes' defense just destroyed Ottawa. And because the Red Blacks scored 21 points, you know, the Alouettes defense gets like eight fantasy points. Yeah, you it's pretty like, much have to score a now. touchdown on defense to have it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, they ought to, you know, maybe they should just double that defensive score or just cut the salary in half for your defense. I mean, Jesus. Yeah. I mean, because again, the Alouettes looked great last week and it was only worth eight points because of stats, you know, come on. Come on, give us, give us a domination statistic or something. <laughs> I mean, at least I didn't have the uh, Argos defense last week because, geez, they got the win and they scored minus three, minus three fantasy points for the Argos defense last week. Of course, you give up thirty six points and four passing touchdowns. Yeah, you kind of deserve that. Mm-hmm. So they probably should have gotten negative six. See, so just double those defensive defensive scores, and then I think it's fair. Uh, if you're going to charge that much, and and I want the kickers back too. I want the kickers back in CFL fantasy. Come on now, come on, kickers. Kickers need love too. So, which team does Trevor Harris play for? That kicker. 
So get four <laughs> field goals a game. Done. <laughs> yeah, and until last week, Trevor Harris was the stat pig. I mean, he's been he's been awesome to play as a fantasy football quarterback for years now. And you know, of course, a, when he went down in the third quarter, so in my chances. <laughs> right? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Last week was the first bad fantasy game he's had in years. Maybe. And it wasn't even bad. It just wasn't. No. <laughs> yeah, it was just seventy-five percent of a game <laughs> rather than the full. If he had had that extra quarter, he might have gotten another hundred yards passing, another four or five you know, fantasy points, even without scoring a touchdown. So Trevor Harris has been a stat machine. And that's the one thing. This is why I asked you about fantasy tips, because I mean, right now it feels like there's two, two legitimate plays at quarterback and Vernon, I have no confidence in him this week. So it's yeah, like, yeah, it's the only guy I saw that was 15 K, which is the highest they go. Yeah. Which but is, I upgraded to him crazy. because I realized I still got six K left after I got received the three wow. receivers I wanted. Wow. Okay, fine. I'll go from Drew Brown to I can fit Vernon in there. What the hell? Why not? <laughs> mm-hmm. Wow. Wow. I don't know about that though. I, I'm not it's I a know, risk. I'm not expecting yeah, I'm not expecting a great game from Vernon this week. I just I have a feeling. So anyway, okay. Well, let's uh let's log it out then. Uh, my name is Oz Davis. This has been the Rouge, White, and Blue CFL podcast, uh, a production of Shotgun Sports Network for my co host Joe Pritchard and our sponsor, RoyalRetros.com. We are out of here for this week. Enjoy the games. Talk to you next week. <laughs>